From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Issue one, FDA vapes. E-cigarettes are battery operated devices that use a mix of nicotine and other chemicals to produce inhalable vapor. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, has just announced new regulations on e-cigarettes, as well as cigars and hookah pipes, affecting underage buyers, manufacturing, marketing, and ingredient labeling. Protection from the dangers of tobacco and nicotine addiction is a public health priority, but the FDA has not banned selling designs or flavored e-cigarettes that are attractive to kids, like Hello Kitty Tutti Fruity, Bugs Bonnie Cotton Candy, or Gummy Bears Vapors. High schoolers vaping e-cigarettes increased usage by, get this, 900% between 2011 and 2015. Proponents of e-cigarettes say the regulations will increase purchase costs, thus discouraging those looking to quit addiction to traditional cigarettes. Also, that there is evidence that e-cigarettes are 95% less harmful than combustible cigarettes. Question, is this good news, Pat Buchanan? You know, John, take a look at progress. When I was in high school, we were 13, 14 years old. Almost everybody smoked cigarettes then. You had a smoking lounge. The annual meeting at Gonzaga High School is known as the smoker. <laughs> and so- Jesuit High School. Jesuit High School right down the street. And but the point here is, look, clearly this is a health hazard. It, smoking is directly related to cancer and emphysema and heart disease and to shortened life and all the rest of it. And the country ought to be given enormous amounts of information about this. And e-cigarettes, which Clarence is into, it's his rotten habit, <laughs> and he'll produce one. I mean, you ought to get all the information you can, but at some point, the government's got to step back and say, here it is, this is as far as we go. Now you're <laughs> mature, even young people, you're mature. It's up to you in a free society to decide. Uh, and I guess the government stepped in to interrupt the smoker's lounge that you grew up it's in, <laughs> and I think that was entirely appropriate. Um, E-cigarettes perform a useful function for people who are smokers because they are less uh, lethal than tobacco, uh, but kids buy them and they contain nicotine. So you're, you're creating a generation of kids who are going to be addicted to, to nicotine and probably will graduate to smoking tobacco. Also, who's making these e-cigarettes? The tobacco companies are making them. Uh, they've diversified uh, their product and I think it's entirely appropriate for the FDA to step in with some regulations here. Uh, how many lives a year are lost by smoking? We address that. Yeah. Four, 480,000, according to the CDC. And I appreciate you giving me uh, prior guidance on that statistic. How many were lost last <laughs> year? How, how many? 480,000. That much, that many last year? And then year. what is what the other statistic is 156 billion in productivity losses. So you, I'm grateful that one time my, the, the testing of the boy, I got a, I got a hand up. But I think that the question, you know, look, the, the, you do not want a situation in which young teenagers are, are smoking nicotine. That's, that's not good. So in some degree, yes, it's important that the FDA comes in and, and puts more restrictions in terms of you have to be 18 to buy it. My concern, though, on the flip side is that if you see the productivity, I mean, the, what, the productivity uh, impact that this will have in terms of increasing costs on the production uh, means that for the vast majority of older users, it, it's going to become more expensive. And also, uh, things like packaging, you know, specific requirements, those regulations, they, those impose costs, uh, but they also, uh, I think, put that sort of punitive intact in terms of the industry developing a product and impinging on free choices of individuals. I think there's a more balanced approach could have been taken, but I think unfortunately the FDA has gone fully to one side. So well, do we think, should gone. there be, hold on for a minute, uh, Clarence. Sure. <laughs> do we need to ban television? advertising on e-cigarettes. I think it already, well, no, I, I, I can't say it already is because I, I have seen some advertising uh, for it on television, uh, not nearly as much as I used to see of, of cigarette advertising. But I agree that uh, 
Uh, it's fine with me to ban them for, for uh, young people you know, uh, under age 18. Uh, something like 85% of smokers start when they were teenagers, like, like I did, you know, what, what you're referring to. Uh, and um, what, what troubles me, of course, is that you've got a lot of kids who, who've never smoked before, but they're vaping because it's a craze. And we don't really know how many of them are going to stay with it long enough to be addicted to nicotine because mm. th that's my trouble now. I'm not smoking anymore, but I'm still addicted to nicotine. That's why I'll, I'll go right. and plot nicotine gum or these uh, vapes. But you know, it's a tragic figure, but you talk about the enormous amounts of money lost from early deaths and all the rest of it. But to, and we all of us have had friends who died of cancer or heart disease or something directly related to two packs a day mm. most of their lives. But mm. the truth is, folks who die young, quite frankly, die less expensively to society than folks who live 80 or 90 and are on Medicare all those years afterwards. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think the I economic think numbers, <laughs> I think, are about how much it costs society are a little phony. You want to go before the death panels and make the case that it's better <laughs> to have people smoking <laughs> because it will save money? That's a kind of a poor well, argument no, to make here. I'm just cost. saying the total cost. <laughs> the yeah. We're all going to die. Yeah. Yeah. If you die at 90, the last six right. months of your life is going to cost yeah. society yeah. a lot more yeah. than folks dying at yeah. 50. Th yeah. That is not an appealing argument for I even the tobacco uh, industry yeah. to make. I, I can, <laughs> I'm going to take it to the next step and kill off the rest of the panel so that I can my cost some Uh Next, let's make sure we hit everybody and everybody's family, okay? The new regulations for cigar makers are some 400 pages long. What, on, what impact will they have on cigar manufacturers, I ask you? It's going to make it much more expensive to buy cigars and right. things like that. The more regulations you put, right. they, they put it on the cost of the manufacturer, and he transfers right. the cost exactly. to the customer. Yeah. Exactly. People who love mm -hmm. cigars, mainly folks, probably working class folks, mm -hmm. are going to have to pay more and more right. of their income for what they enjoy. Well, like like, another good reason like Clarence, but, but like Clarence, Clarence he doesn't you enjoy it, you can afford it. I mm -hmm. mean, and, and no, so at some point, right. you got to stop with the regulations. If you want less exactly. of it, you got to tax it more, and you got to have regulations. My father well, died of cancer. He smoked cigars. But you, <laughs> they're they're you, just as lethal as cigarettes. You're just pricing working class people out of the market where Clarence mm -hmm. can afford his e-cigarettes. And that's what's happened, though. Oh. Uh, that, that's a big reason why smoking has, has, has gone down uh, as, uh, in America because of all the taxation. Uh, and uh, at the same time, though, uh, like Eleanor said, uh, uh, tobacco companies are covering <laughs> their losses by in encouraging e-cigs. The same uh, thing e is with alcohol. Look, mm -hmm. everybody knows alcohol also shortens life. But the problem with alcohol, of course, is you can kill somebody else when you're drunk in a car and had too much to drink. That's right. But you keep taxing it and all the rest of it, and uh, and that's got a real problem attended to it as well. But uh, you can also are kill we somebody. Stop well, if we're going to look yeah. at economic inequality in this country, I think there are other places to start than the fact that you mean, poorer people have to pay more for their don't alcohol. Don't go into your Bernie Sanders uh, routine. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> Regulations have a really punitive impact, and I think mm -hmm. that is a debate. Sure. You know, that, and it's obvious. You look at California, construction of properties versus Texas, well, yeah. exodus of wealth. But regulations matter, and they affect well, those lower rungs. There are some behaviors mm -hmm. you want to encourage, and some you want to right. discourage. These discourage. are public health issues. But we shouldn't. And the, and the regulations should discourage them. The is FDA the Obama is on a very strong footing here. Is the Obama administration on a regulatory binge? Yes. Yeah, well, this is, he's de Blasio squared. Of course he is. Yeah. In a complicated society, you need to protect the public. That requires regulations. It's not a binge. It's appropriate. Well, I remember under the Bush administration, they deregulated uh, aviation too far and had to put a lot of the safety regulations back in. So there's a reason for these regulations, and we can reasonably uh, debate, you know, wh what is most appropriate. But uh, I, I feel like stop me before I smoke again. I'm not against <laughs> anti-smoking right. regulations. But these regulatory <laughs> obstacles, and I think it has to be the great example for conservatives to take the lead and, and at the state level. Uh, federal ultimately in terms of saying no look these are look at this regulation look at the punitive yeah. impact it is having mm -hmm. and this is why you want to yeah. repeal it have the debate. I think there's mm -hmm. not even going to be a conservative campaign against these regulations in the great well, scheme the of but, okay. but, but broadly yeah. on well, regulations. that's been the conservative you don't know song Trump. for a long time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what President Trump feels about this. <laughs> uh, then I quote the figure of how many American lives are lost per year by smoking. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah Tom did. Um, did, what did he, what, what did he get? You know, uh, again, John, people, everybody in America is going to die. And what this says is some are going to die earlier, and if they do, it's tragic, 
but in terms of economics, it is less expensive. Yeah. I'm, not so sure sure because, I'm, not, I'm not so sure because those last months of life are the most expensive on true, average, yeah. no matter but how but old you but are, the old right? Folks, it goes on and on. I mean, yeah. you're on that's Medicare right. for decades these whether days. You, whether you're smoked or not, I mean, you know, exactly. that's both ways. When, one other thing, though, we talk about, you know, the, the undercurrent here that throws throughout is, unfortunately, there isn't enough personal responsibility. You know, these mm -hmm. parents should be paying more attention to what their kids are doing. Ground them. But oh, also, well, people. You have but kids. Uh, let me. No, wait, let me. So you become a parent, Tom. <laughs> right. I well, can't wait. Right. I'm going to check I in I on guess, you. I guess I'm going to check in on you, pal. I, I, I tell you, Clarence, I yield to that. I don't have enough experience there. But I would also say, my generation, for example, one big problem we have is that the casual use, not so much in D.C. because of security clearances, but in other major American cities in terms of cocaine use, mm -hmm. that it's fashionable, that it's okay. The problem, I think, with that is instead of, you know, yes, it should be illegal, but at the same time, there needs to be much more of a public campaign of awareness to millennials in terms of where those people like FARC and where those drugs are coming from and the horrific abuses and corruption and yeah. political destruction that that funds. That, that, uh, you got to be very, very careful how you advertise to millennials you when know, you start advertising the dangers because a lot, a lot of the early anti-smoking commercials, it turned out, actually encouraged kids to go out, yeah. go out and smoke yeah. inadvertently. The, reason, so the reason you have terrorists and criminals yeah. and cartels and all that is because you outlaw cocaine. Cocaine, if you didn't, well, if, if you didn't, you'd way. have guys down the street selling it. Well, That's but right. here's, here's yeah. the question, though. What, to what the to libertarians would argue that. Yeah, yeah. no, and I think it's actually something you have to consider. But my, my concern is also, if you look at the statistics, that uh, people <coughs> on drugs are more predisposed to commit crime. So there is a public this protection is going element in terms of pretty far afield, yeah. pretty far afield from uh, vaping. Yeah. Email <laughs> uh, as long as you cigarettes. bring it up, though, you know yeah. we have a problem now with with prescription drugs leading to exactly. uh, illegal uh, consumption, like like oxycontin le yeah. leading to, to heroin, because the same same impact, but it's a lot cheaper. So it uh, cuts both ways. Thanks your question. Should Congress overturn this regulatory overreach? Yes or no? Congress can't do anything, I don't think, without a president. Well, they we, don't we, have one we now. Ha we do, <laughs> we do have a president, but the answer is no, regardless of who the president is, and we do have a president. It should be illegal until you're 18, but yes, they should overturn the majority of it. And yeah, I don't see any sympathy out there for the nicotine producers. I mean, yeah. I mean, some of the most hated people around, uh, perhaps worse than the gun industry. Uh, it's really, uh, so, so I don't think this is overreach. I think the government is uh, uh, correct to try to discourage smoking. I, I wouldn't put anybody in jail for it, though. But my question, Congress or the president? Congress, Congress or the president? The both 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 my question, Congress or the president? This president won't. What, what did you actually yeah. ask? Uh, I think you said Congress. Rain in the FDA. <laughs> As I said, John, you'd have to have a president who would agree with what Congress did, and we right, don't have right, that president. Right, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Issue two, New York rot. I believe in the justice system in this nation, and uh, we'll pursue whatever remedy the system makes available. To many, it is America's beacon state, energetic, diverse, tough. But New York faces a corrosive problem, corruption. Former Speaker of the New York Assembly, Sheldon Silver, was sentenced to 12 years in prison after being found guilty on federal corruption charges. And Mr. Silver is only the tip of the iceberg. Investigators are also underway against two individuals with close links to Governor Andrew Cuomo and his so-called Buffalo Billion plan to revitalize the city of Buffalo. And at least three prosecutors, state, local, and city, are investigating New York Mayor Bill de Blasio for possible campaign finance misconduct. And note this, a number of NYPD police officers are under investigation for potential illegal sales of gun licenses. And other NYPD officers are under investigation for possibly providing favors to city residents in return for expensive gifts. Question, according to Gallup, 75% of Americans think corruption in government is widespread. Are they right? Eleanor Cliff. Well, first of all, you're conflating some very different uh, scandals in New York. Uh, Sheldon Silver was taking kickbacks for decades, and he should, he should go to jail. Uh, campaign finance va violations concerning uh, the mayor, that's a, a lot different. You could go to almost every state in this country. Clarence's home state of Illinois has had a lot of uh, experience uh, with uh, state corruption. I'm shocked. Alabama shocked. today, <laughs> a couple of officials are, uh, are indicted. 
But that's not what the American people are really worked up about. What they're worked up about is the kind of corruption that you see from the governor of Michigan when you ignore a water crisis in Flint. In, in Flint. Uh, the, people are worked up when they look at a Congress that doesn't, that doesn't perform. They're angry at Washington. Uh, maybe you know, in these individual states you have some angry populations, but uh, it, corruption, unfortunately, has been uh, part of politics for a long time. I don't think it's, it's, it's gone up. And I would point out that President Obama has had a scandal-free eight years. He's been an absolute uh, role model in terms of how a public official should conduct himself. The government is corrupt. Americans believe some has climbed almost 10% under Barack Obama. Is that a coincidence? And then you had Bernanke's Wall Street bailout, the massive waste on subsidies like Solyndra. Anger over special interests is building. You know, John. But you're, talk you're talking about perceptions <laughs> of corruption <laughs> yeah. as opposed to actual corruption. There's a yeah. big difference there. John. Uh, I think a big, big reason why people think of, uh, think the government's more corrupt is because they've got more media now and more access to information, which is good. That's a result of transparency, which, which I would submit yeah. is actually reduced look, corruption. I mean, if you take government overall, state, federal, municipal level, it probably spends six trillion dollars a year. Now, some of that money is going to get stuck to certain people's hands. Yep. I mean, that's been endemic for a long, long time. You know, I don't think there's any worse corruption job, but I will say this. Over legislation and over regulation, take campaign finance laws. I've been in politics for years. That didn't exist back there when you had the 1960s Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon. I mean, there are 10,000 ways you can violate those laws, not even knowing what you're doing or making a mistake. Take McDonald, the governor of Virginia. I mean, apparently he had a buddy, make, gave him a watch and stuff, and he, he well, did a favor for the guy, and all of a sudden he's in jail. Things that yeah. were normal <laughs> are now criminal. Yeah, well, 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 the thing about Virginia is that kind of activity had been legal for so exactly. long, and it's still in that gray area, whereas it's illegal in other states. Exactly. So, so, yeah. so again, uh, yeah. you know, wh what do we mean by corruption? Well, you know? maybe, right. maybe Governor McDonald shouldn't go to be behind bars for a decade, <laughs> but to, to portray what he did is, oh, just taking a watch, and the next thing you knew, he was being indicted. He took tens of thousands of dollars for personal uh, use. And I don't think the taxpayers like well, that. I think the unique thing about the United States is that if you look at, for example, New York City, you know, the greatest city in the world, I would say that, but Moscow, for example, can you imagine that? I mean, the corruption in Moscow, corruption mm -hmm. in London, oh. Paris, is far greater and mm -hmm. far less scrutiny, both in terms of media, because there's a lack of yeah, ability in terms of wasn't lawsuits. Wasn't your prime minister's defamation. father found out to have an account down in the Panama Papers? But I'm, I'm, yeah. tell you, I'm America. <laughs> I might tell you again. You know, yeah, but right, right. Uh, but, but look, there, I there is, you did, but, but also, uh, you know, because of the NYPD, internal affairs, FBI, th there is that opportunity. But yes, yeah. it, it, wherever it happens, it is outrageous. It is a betrayal. And I think it's a, you, the juxtaposition is the young 18-year-old, 19-year-old soldier, female, male, who makes that oath, and the person in Congress or the Assembly who makes their oath, and that betrayal, that's where it becomes foul. Okay. And that's why it requires very robust uh, Have scandals like the IRS targeting of conservatives <laughs> and the Justice Department operation Fast and Furious played a role. That's ideological, well, that's John. Only, yeah. only, that's only ideological. Sort of it's a left-wing right. administration that's, going that's after the right. Yeah. And, you know, and obviously, quite frankly, when the conservatives get in, I'm sure they'll, they'll the same, respond. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, you, Pat, you hit on, on it before. Yeah. When you when you got this much money and that much access, somebody's going to have sticky fingers, and that's why we need to have more transparency so that people can really know what's what's going well, so on. So you mentioned media, all kinds. You've got twenty four hour a day media. You got ten year olds doing research in yep. the politics, <laughs> all, digging up all this stuff, putting it on the web, and all yeah. the rest of it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's not twice a day newspaper coming out at a big investment. No, that's good. No, nope. <laughs> yep. you know, yep. no. I have a good question. Yeah. It's, but I'll tell you this, John, yep. one point. Excuse me, exit question. By lying to Americans about being able to keep their health insurance to get his legislation passed, did President Obama contribute to distrust of Washington? No, he still got that pit burr in your saddle, he, don't he, you? He, he contributed <laughs> to dr distrust of himself. He contributed yeah. to distrust of himself, but not of government, John. But well, I will most say this. people have kept their health insurance, uh, and that's better right. than most but, of the but lying take all this, government. Take what we're talking about. <laughs> I do, do think it explains why confidence in the whole idea of democracy is sinking rapidly. 
Oh, oh, what? Well, well, um, well it's not that uh, rapid. Yeah, for yeah. a while. The, the, the president delivered on a pledge to uh, expand health insurance for a lot of people in this country who didn't have it. There were some mistakes made along the way, yes, but the end product is uh, is, is historic and uh, something that he but should take credit. Mistakes were made. Yeah, yeah. but the difference. Uh, is everybody. Yeah, all right, we're getting that, out. But very, yeah. very few people actually lost their health care. Yeah, I, right. I think if what Pat says, the destruction trust. I want to come back to Obamacare another day. Didn't you say something to me outside in connection with this? Like the Greeks say, the fish rots from the head down. Head first. Uh, well, I'll take it. I, I didn't say it. Uh, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say he's a rotting yeah. fish, yeah, the president. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you want to bring that back to Chicago? How about Al Capone said that? Issue three, Warrior Olympics. Like Prince Harry, I am so incredibly inspired by all of you. I'm inspired by your courage, by your love of country. Gathering in Orlando, Florida, wounded U.S. military personnel and veterans and their allied counterparts competed at the 2016 Invictus Games. Established in 2014 by Britain's Prince Henry of Wales, also known as Prince Harry, the Invictus Games is a sporting event for wounded, sick, or ill active duty personnel and veterans. These include Paralympic track and field archery, Paralympic swimming, wheelchair basketball and tennis, and triathlon. This year, warrior athletes from 15 nations, including Australia, Afghanistan, Britain, Canada, Denmark, Estonia, Iraq, and New Zealand. But the Invictus Games have another purpose alongside sporting competition, bringing attention to the challenges faced by wounded warriors and their families and to caregiving efforts to support them. Question, what does Orlando show us? I ask you, Clarence Page. Well, it shows us uh, what uh, skill, stamina, and determination can bring to some, some, some very courageous and uh, just, just terrific wounded warriors there and uh, how all the rest of us can show our appreciation. Now, I'm thinking Prince Harry's mother must mm -hmm. be looking down from above. I mean, she was uh, so involved in going after all the landmines and all over the in, mm -hmm. in uh, war-torn areas. And uh, you know, Harry had a kind of a playboy reputation not so long ago. So he's really matured, and I think this is a wonderful thing he's doing. And, and I give a shout out to Michelle Obama and also uh, Jill Biden, who have really uh, worked over these last eight years on behalf of veterans' causes because there's a, mm -hmm. a lot of need out there, as those images showed us. I think yeah. Harry John was a pilot, helicopter pilot in, in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a forward air controller. Uh, yeah, and I mean, it really shows the, the old British tradition, uh, going all the way back to Harriet Agincourt. Huh? <laughs> 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 but really, that the, the royalty fights alongside the troops. It's a great tradition. Yeah. I think Prince so Andrew, was who was a Agincourt Prince, was Prince Andrew, I think, was down in the Falkland Islands yeah. when they brought the, took those back. But it's a great mm -hmm. tradition, and this young guy who's, who's been in a lot of antics and clown acts out <laughs> in Las <laughs> Vegas yeah. is doing a wonderful thing here. But it also shows something else, John, is the See all these fellows now, we save so many more right. wounded and injured in combat. I think World War II, one died and two were saved, but now with the, the helicopters coming in, the medevacs, all these things right on top of it, removing, you save an awful lot more folks, and so you have a lot more folks that to uh, right. take care and, of. And thanks to a lot of government regulations, uh, people with all kinds of um, disabilities are not hidden away. They're out and very much part of life. Well, and but, I think but it those also requires, I think, that, that in innovation, a lot of it is military culture, right, where you predominantly have young men, increasingly young women, who've also, you know, served on the front lines very courageously. But, but showing these individuals who've served the country that just because they have had a serious injury, or they've been wounded seriously, either, you know, psychologically or physically, nothing is over. It's a change and that that warrior spirit hyper comp competitive. It's not a fun game smiling. They want to win. And that's it's that it's, it's making that reality important and, and showing people that their path going forwards, uh, that the mm -hmm. country values them in tangible ways as well. You know, it's well, not, you're you not just not, a sort of a hand round. Somewhere. You could not be more right. What motivated Prince Harry to become involved in the games was that after sharing a helicopter ride with three seriously injured soldiers, Referring from Afghanistan, he felt a sense of comradeship 
and a calling to participate in their recovery. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think that's why yeah. I'm sure a lot of vets admire him because he right. went out there right there with them. And I think they right probably on. also admire him for his Las Vegas antics because I think a lot of <laughs> you know. <laughs> He's redeemed himself, I would say, uh, after all, right. all that. With both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's really true, though. I, I used to live near, near Walter Reed Hospital and, uh, you know, uh, Every wounded warrior I've run into just wants to get back into service again. Right. That's the thing. It just doesn't stop. Yeah. And that's really uh, yeah. one of the great lessons of my life. Yeah. yeah I've been out there. And I know what you're talking about. Mm. Exit question. Do the Invictus Games achieve their purpose? Yes or no, quickly? Sure. Oh, yes, yes. Absolutely. Keep going. That's right. Keep doing it. Predictions. Pat. Uh, the conflict between the United States and China and the Philippines over the islands in the so disputed islands in the South China Sea is going to deepen, and I think it's going to come one of these days to shooting. Uh, George W. Bush got 40% of the Hispanic vote. Mitt Romney got 27% of the Hispanic vote. Uh, Donald Trump will be lucky to get half of what Mitt Romney got, which will doom him as a winner in November. Yeah, I think the uh, debate over Obamacare is going to be a really tough one for Hillary Clinton coming up to November increasingly because it's an economic touchstone issue, uh, and I would say it, it poses issues of inequality that, that are troubling for her. Uh, I predict that uh, vaping will be banned because it's just too good to last. <laughs> Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll we're going to find something wrong with it. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to check out vaping right away. Orthodoxy yeah. against hedonism. They're going to find something wrong I with it. I predict gold will boom in price this year as investors come to realize that central banks the world over, including our own Federal Reserve, have no clue how to return the economy to normal. Bye-bye. Looking for these? You drive buzzed. It could be one very expensive ride. First, you gotta make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. And my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving.